Welcome to another installment of Friday Q&A, you bunch of legends. I hope you've all had a fantastic week. Thank you all so much for the questions which were submitted this week. If you would like me to answer one of your questions, pop it in the comment section below. And as always, you can check the video description for various ways to support my channel directly. Let's go. on Fender Made in Japan guitars are generally pretty positive. This jazz bass that I own, which is basically my only bass guitar, is an 89 Made in Japan jazz bass, and it's a fantastic instrument. In fact, I bought this the very first year I ever went to the States, and Ryan played it on that entire US tour. Pretty sure he played it on our 2013 tour as well, which was the longest overseas tour we ever did. So he's kind of thrashed this and recorded with it, and anytime I pick this up, I enjoy it even though I don't play bass that much. So if the rest of the line is kind of like this, then yeah, generally positive thoughts. I haven't had a whole lot of experience with the newer Made in Japan stuff, but I know people generally glow about it. And uh, my opinion with Fender, whether it's their Made in Japan stuff, their Made in Mexico stuff, even a lot of the newer Squire stuff that I've tried, it's all really, really good. And I think as a brand, their general kind of quality across the line has been pretty consistent for the last 15, 20 years, unlike some other companies of which we shall not speak. On the topic of Japanese made guitars, my thoughts on ESP guitars in particular, they're Japanese made models. ESP, everything I've tried has generally been pretty darn good. I will just say that some of the models just aren't 100% to my taste, but as somebody who has a little bit of an understanding into what it takes to actually make guitars consistently the way companies do, I gotta give credit to ESP because whether it's their high-end Japanese made stuff, whether it's stuff like the Edward stuff that they do or the LTD models, I find myself kind of consistently recommending them as a brand that you know my students should check out when they want to upgrade their beginner guitars to something a little bit more serious. And again, unlike some other brands out there, they've been able to maintain that quality over the last you know few decades. And some of their stuff from back in the day is now considered kind of vintage and classic, like especially if you're a Queensryche fan like me, you look at the older ESPs that Queensryche played and the gas definitely starts bubbling up. But I would really like to try maybe one of their more kind of vintage style things. And of course, you got the George Lynch connection in there as well. One day I would love to get a kamikaze and add it to the collection because I just think they look so darn cool. My favorite pedal based preamp, I'm gonna rule out things like the Fractal FM3 or the Line 6 HX Stomp. Two immediately come to mind. One would be the Rev G3, the purple Rev pedal, which I've demoed on the channel before. Sounds amazing into a power amp and a cabinet, and it really, really does a good job of capturing that kind of modded Marshall 5150 high gain thing. If you like high gain sounds that are kind of based on that brown sound, I think you would really, really like that pedal. The other one is the Crazy Tube Circuits Black Magic, which does a little bit more of a boogie thing. I've also got a demo video on here, and that into a power amp absolutely rips. And the low end's really kind of tight and chunky, and you can get a really singing mid focus thing with it, or you can scoop the mids right out and just go chug, chug a chug. Bare knuckle pickups. I don't have any guitars with bare knuckle pickups. Several of my friends do, and every time I've tried them, again, I've generally been very, very impressed. It's a little bit like the ESP thing for me. They're kind of unquestionably very, very good. There's no real reason that I don't own any of their stuff, aside from the fact that I just haven't really got around to checking it out. I will say though that even though stuff like the Cold Sweat Humbucker, which I've tried and is really, really good, would probably appeal to my taste, the stuff that I've tried that's more the vintage voice stuff, like their PAF style pickups that I've tried in certain guitars have been really, really good. And they're another company that probably really, really deserves their reputation. And again, it's cool to see a company that's kind of run by fellow gearheads as well. Speaking of tasty pieces of gear I wanna check out, the Line 6 DL4 Mark II, yes, I did see that release and 
you know, I got a DL4 recently, which is a super fun pedal. And it seems like the DL4 fixes most of the issues people had with that. Like there's analog drive through and there's MIDI and there's a mic preamp on there and you can add reverb to all the modes. So while I don't have any existing relationship with Yamaha in Australia or Line 6, if people want to see me demo that pedal, I will go out and buy one so that you can all see me just deep dive into the DL4. If you want to see that video, let me know in the comments. This is a really good question. It's popped up a few times, but it basically boils down to using vintage rack equipment versus software-based plugins for studio style stuff. And is the rack stuff just basically fancy furniture you use to impress your clients when you really can do everything with software? And look, I would just say like anything hardware versus software, you're gonna get the same drawbacks and you're gonna get the same advantages like off the top of my head. If you've got hardware, you don't have to worry about things like an iLock or Apple updating Mac OS and your plugins no longer being compatible with them. You know, an old Eventide H3500 or an old TC2290 still basically sounds exactly the same as it did when it came out. The drawback being, you know, those units have power supplies and capacitors and chips in them and things that can fail, whereas a piece of software doesn't require that hardware maintenance. I think you can get amazing sounds out of both and you can definitely use both for pretty much any style of music. Like if the hardware or the software feels like it's getting in the way of you making the music, maybe that's not really the case. Maybe it's actually the strength of your musical ideas. And you know, if you work on the actual music aspect of it, you'll be able to kind of plow through that regardless of whether you have a rack delay or a delay plugin. So I really wanna do a video with friend of the channel, Mr. Troy Nababan over the next few weeks or few months where we dive into mixing a whole song only using outboard rack gear. I think that could be incredibly fun, but I think it just boils down to character. Like the cool thing about something like an old digital delay line is that all the filtering in there is still analog and it gets crusty and it has character and attitude and you can definitely replicate that with software. It just depends if that particular piece of software replicates your hardware unit exactly the way you like it. You know, an old Roland SDE, the preamp doesn't have a huge amount of headroom and the filters in there have a particular character. And if you like the way that sounds, just like using a particular Marshall JCM 800, you might have a particularly good one that you know is gonna sound good with a particular cabin mic and it lets you work really quickly and it gets you to the place you wanna be faster. So the music will flow. I think that's a good thing. And that applies to hardware or software. So let me know your thoughts in the video description. I don't think it boils down to, well, this piece of software sounds objectively better than this hardware or vice versa. It comes down to this really important kind of nebulous thing we talk about with music, which is character and subjectivity and, you know, the art and the craft of recording, these things that you know, they are a little bit elusive sometimes and that's part of the fun and part of the chase and part about putting down a particular idea at a particular point in time and capturing it. How do I like to wire up all my guitars and cabling and all that kind of stuff? Is there any particular snake oil or has someone put crocodile oil because I'm in Australia? Don't worry, we have lots and lots of snakes in Australia as well, so the snake oil definitely flows. But uh, yeah, I'm not big on the whole I need to buy a brand new guitar and immediately pull out the pickups and the pots and put in bumblebee caps and you know uh, burns potentiometers and stuff like that. I tend to leave most of my stuff stock until it breaks. And even then, when it comes to like guitar cables, I learned the hard way. Just you know, when we were on tour in America, just going to guitar center and buy the cheapest cables because you're gonna break them anyway. You know, they're gonna end up thrown around. Someone's gonna wheel a Marshall 4x12 cabinet over it and rip it apart. So yeah, uh, save the heartache and just use that. I'm sure there are appreciable differences when it comes to certain construction things like that. But yeah, I just tend to use whatever's laying around. And it was kind of like we were talking about last week with guitar picks and wood and things like that. You know, control the controllables and try not to worry about anything outside of your control. If something's gonna go bad and you don't have control over that, well, you know, all you can change is your attitude towards it and your reaction towards it. On the topic of controlling the controllables, it was pointed out to me, and this is a really good point, and yes, I am a massive hypocrite. You know, I passed the buck 
talking about Tonewood and I really sat on the fence with that one last week, but then I went on to talk about how I can hear an appreciable difference between two different types of plastic pick. And am I just a massive hypocrite? Yeah, probably. But I would say in my defense that what I was trying to say is that if I've got a guitar in my hands, it's significantly more difficult to change the wood in the guitar than it is to change the pick. So I can hear that difference if there is any difference a lot faster. I can change picks in five seconds and then compare the tone by recording it back to back and then listening back to it than it would be to say change the maple cap on one of my guitars or something like that. Changing pickups is another thing, changing pots, you know. There is definitely a scientific way to go about evaluating that. Again, I was kind of saying, I don't know how much it's worth the investment of time on my end when I have a guitar that I know I like it and I like that guitar. So kind of treating it more like an individual thing than a system. But look, I am interested in things like that. I would say that the whole tone wood thing is really a materials problem. Like it would come down to material properties of the timber, less about the species and more about things like density and rigidity and a few other things like that, which I think would be quantifiable, but I'm not the person to quantify it. People want to know about the cat. Uh, the cat's asleep right here. So I'm not going to disturb her because she gets super angry with me, but Tibby is about 16 years old, totally deaf. And if everybody was familiar with Skanky Boy, Studio Cat, the original Studio Cat, this is actually his daughter. So he was about 16, 17, we're not too sure. He was a rescue and she's his daughter, also another rescue. I think they were about a year apart. And uh, yeah, aside from being totally deaf, she's doing great. She's a love of life in here. She's still really, really playful, uh, really, really healthy. We took her to the vet not too long ago and the vet was like, look, if you didn't tell me that she was deaf and she was 16, I wouldn't have realized that. So uh, Kat is doing very, very well. And a shout out to everybody on Patreon who supports me and helps me feed my cat. You're all champions and she appreciates it. That is it for this week's Q&A. Thanks for the questions. They were a whole lot of fun to answer. Again, if you've got questions you would like me to answer on next week's Q&A, Put them in the comment section below. And last weekend over in Perth, we did a little White Snake tribute show, me and a bunch of my friends from various bands in Perth. So put a little bit of that up for you. Uh, shout out to Dom and Seb for providing this footage. Have a fantastic weekend. I'll see you next Friday. Yeah.